So Jezartaki will be a bit late, so maybe let me take the honor and introduce you Professor Konstantin Mikhailov from University of Follow from 6G Wireless Center there. Uh, it's in Finland, it's towards the north. There is a lot of polar light involved in the process, but also one of the most talented and large and productive research team in Northern Europe working on wireless communications, maybe in Europe at large. So, Konstantin, please help yourself. I think the floor is yours. You could get the people know your background considerably better. Yeah. Okay. So thank you, Vitalis, and just and thank you for so just for being here. So just it's a great pleasure for me. Yeah. Sorry for my so just a bit low voice. So just I got a bit cold. Uh, so just while so just while staying here. So but hopefully my voice won't go away so during the presentation. <laughs> so uh, otherwise I'll have to move the sides. Uh, so um, yes. So just Vitalik has already introduced me. So just I will. Uh, go in a bit more detail uh, so just about uh, so just our uh, so just work, so just my background. Uh, so we are doing the introduction section, so this won't be too long. Uh, so then my plan for today is to go so just through uh, so just some discussion and motivation of so just IoT and the drivers for non-terrestrial IoT, so as well as for some challenges, so just especially focusing on direct satellite, uh, so just IoT approach on which we are working on. Uh, so just then present some exemplary results from our recent projects and to give some uh, concluding remarks. Uh, so the presentation, especially the first part, won't be too technical. Uh, so, just, and, uh, so just if you're interested about the technical details, so just to give the references to the papers. So just then we can discuss. So just in practical, I just wanted to give a more generic overview so just of what we are doing. So just in case there are some uh, overlaps, so just and maybe provide you also some interesting facts. Okay, so, uh, so just as we already said, so my name is Konstantin Mikhailov. I'm assistant professor at the Center of Wireless Communications, so as well as the University of Oslo. So I have got my doctoral degree, so just a doctor of technology, um, so just from the University of Oslo, so just the same place in 2018. So then, uh, so just one year after, I started as assistant professor there. Uh, so just now, so just uh, going for the training track formation, so just next year. So just and the main focus for my uh, research, so quite a long one, so just has been on uh, MTC and IoT radio access technologies. So as well as system design, uh, device design, so just experimental activities and all this stuff. So so I have so just also some previous industrial experience for full stack IoT device development, including electronics and embedded firmware applications, certifications and other stuff. So just and so some after that quite some publications so we'll have to go through those. Uh, and over the past years, I have worked with, I think, most of the radio access technologies which are currently being used by IoT. Uh, so recently, more focused on the server ones, but before, have a long history. So just working with low power wide area network, uh, mesh networks, um, so, just, uh, so just a long list of the different so just practical technologies, so just having hands on experience with those. So the major uh, research tracks, so just which uh, are currently ongoing in my research group, so just are focused on, of course, wireless technologies, both IoT and especially low power right hand network technologies. Uh, so recently we started uh, moving more towards uh, non-terrestrial networks, so just that means drones, and especially multi-connected drones, multi-radio access, for the, uh, so just for the UVs and um, so just aerial systems as well as direct satellite radio connectivity, so specifically for the Internet of Things. So, but also, so just we are working on different vertical tracks, so just thinking of healthcare, automotive, uh, agriculture. So just use cases, how can we use IoT there, so just what technologies we should use there, so just what are the requirements, how do we do the optimizations and things like that. So, by the way, Vitaly, what's going to be uh, our plan about the questions? Are we taking them right away? or up to you. It's usually the speaker's privilege to... to, to so I can all refer to this. So just if, if there is something so just people want to ask, I think we can... Go ahead. The floor is yours. Mm -hmm. okay. If anyone so has a question, please feel free to interrupt. Okay, okay. so as I meant, uh, so just, okay, maybe... Uh, so just maybe you can watch uh, so just also the teams. So just if there is some questions. Do that. I'm doing that. Okay. So uh, so some key team members. So just of uh, so just of my group. Uh, so just mostly of the doctoral research from level. Uh, so just Muhammad Assad, who is in the non-terrestrial and satellite communications. So a good share of the results presented in this presentation. So just we are taking 
So, so they're all working on um, UAS connectivity, so, so just especially awareness of drones, by drones, and so on. So just also to some extent, we are available for any communication. John Marco also just focusing on experimental research, also just also in the context of um, unmanned aerial systems and low power wide area networks. So just recently, Mohammed has joined, uh, so just focusing on uh, multi radio access optimizations and especially uh, so just this uh, radio frequency visual light communication IoT. So just to have one European project on that. So also there is one open position, so just focusing on the agriculture, so just one project related to that. So that's the list of the ongoing projects. So just I'm not going to go through the details. Uh, so just in yellow are shown the international projects, mostly European ones, uh, so just quite big ones, uh, so just involving typically eight, ten partners from the different European uh, so just countries. So and then so just white ones are the national projects. Uh, so just the projects are based on the date, uh, so just where so just on their end. So as you can see, we have a number of projects, as in zero four projects, focusing on drones. Uh, so we're just starting from the general perspective of communication, so just for the drones and after some use cases like this primary project focuses on wildfires. So then satellite communication and um, so also some more specialized specialized projects. Yes, so just like in the last minute I have added so just one slide. So uh, about quick facts about uh, so just our organizations, so the center of wireless communications. Uh, so just just to illustrate you where it is. Um, so if you so just want also Vitaly has so just explain so in the northern part of Finland or probably you can consider uh, so just that it is in the very middle of Finland. So but from us just in Finnish scale it's considered to be the northern part of Finland, so quite close to the polar circle. So just if you are know for example where uh, Rovaniemi in Santa Claus is, so just it's about 150 kilometers from there. Uh, so probably that's the most north, uh, let's say technical uh, research center, uh, so just focusing on wireless communications or one of the most most. Uh, so just and um, so just the unit, uh, so just uh, which I'm representing. So it is composed of about, I think the numbers are a bit uh, outdated, but now I think about 200 people, so just working on different aspects of wireless communications. So divided into two groups, uh, so just focusing on radio technologies and networks. Uh, so just quite international now, so just as a whole, half of our staff members are of non Finnish origin. Uh, so just and, uh, most of our funding is coming from external projects, uh, so just at uh, national, international level. Um, okay, I think that's that's it about uh, their introduction. And let me so just move to the core, so just of my today presentation. So, just, um, so the non-terrestrial IIT. Actually, before going to that, so just let me uh, so just make a few short remarks. So just. Uh, about the notation of the Internet of Things, which I will be using throughout my presentation. Uh, so just when speaking about the Internet of Things, so just I will treat it quite uh, generically, so just meaning, so just, uh, so just this definition which has been given by uh, so just ITU team, so that it is a global infrastructure of the information society which enables advanced services by interconnecting physical and digital things, uh, so just based on uh, so just, uh, virus information and communication technologies. So this definition is quite generic, so just it doesn't exclude uh, so just many of the technologies, or just like for example, uh, Bluetooth or whatever, so just it doesn't require uh, so just internet connectivity, uh, so just the use of internet protocol. So that's why so just I like it. So if so just the key point here is that when we are speaking about the Internet of Things, or when I'm speaking about the Internet of Things, so just it's going to be quite generic. Uh, so and similar, so just when uh, so just I will be speaking about the machine type communication, I will also treat it quite generically. Uh, so just meaning under that, so the set of connectivity technologies for the Internet of Things. So not just the CGPP, so but also much more broad, uh, so just range of the technologies. So please keep that in mind, because quite often, so just I'm getting the questions so just whether this or that technology belongs to, uh, so just IT radio access, so just for MTC or not. So some, let me start with some facts about the Internet of Things. Uh, so just some big numbers. So just we have a lot of devices, more are coming. Uh, so just based on the prognosis, these uh, so uh, statistics. 
uh, so just by 2025, three out of four each new devices which will be connected anywhere, so just will belong to the Internet of Things. So there is great market potential. Uh, so just last but not least, uh, uh, so just is the sustainability aspect of the Internet of Things. Uh, so it was quite hard to find the digits, but uh, so just uh, one of the uh, reports so just estimated that uh, so just a year, carbon footprint of the Internet of Things by 2027 uh, so just can range from 22 to 153 uh, 53, uh, million of CO2 equivalent tons per year. So just in case if only the simple devices so just will be uh, deployed and will be much more than that. Uh, so just if so just we will go for more advanced devices. So whether it is much or, or not, so just you can see from here. So I have uh, provided some estimation of how this maps against the whole uh, carbon footprint of the United States. So we are speaking about several persons in the best case scenario, and some dozens and up to the quarter, so just of the whole United States carbon footprint, so just in the worst case scenario. So we can expect that the will be quite substantial impact, so just from deploying such systems. Uh, so just on the general scale. Uh, so just okay. So just and also, uh, so just if you have worked uh, so just previously with uh, so just IoT, so just and machine tech communication technology, so just you know that uh, traditionally there have been uh, so just a great number of devices and a great number of uh, technologies uh, supporting their uh, so just terrestrial uh, component of the Internet of Things. So like. Uh, personal body and wide area networks. So I think that's the majority of the devices are now there. So just also recently, we are starting to have in all these autonomous machines. So just V2X communication and so on. So, but also recently, so just uh, we have got, so just quite uh, a push towards the aerial uh, component, including the UAVs, uh, so just and other, uh, so just unmanned aerial systems, high altitude platforms. And recently we also started looking towards uh, so just a space, so just I see the term of internet space things. Uh, so just but uh, here I think we will be mostly speaking about using of um, non-terrestrial and especially satellite infrastructure for establishing the communication for, uh, so just for the IoT devices. Uh, so just and, uh, just a quick quick reminder. So just when speaking about the space uh, the space communication, so there are multiple uh, types of uh, so the satellite systems. Low Earth orbit, medium geostationary, so just uh, held in place and so on. So recently, so just, there, are, there are also the talks about the very low Earth orbit satellite. So, um, also in 3GPP, so just now, uh, so just I'm looking quite actively towards the non terrestrial networks. Uh, so, just focusing mostly on the two components of that. So, the aerial components and especially the unmanned aerial systems and the satellite networks. Uh, so just uh, and they typically are referred to low Earth orbit and mostly geostationary orbit satellites. Okay, so just, uh, another trend which we can, we have seen quite recently so just is the increase of the uh, average height around the uh, ground level, uh, so just of the uh, Internet of Things devices. Not only so just of the mobile IoT devices like drones, so just in time treating those as IoT devices as well. Uh, so, but also so just uh, other types of uh, so just, uh, of IoT deployment, uh, so just as part of smart city. Uh, so, just for example, uh, so just I need to present other use cases. So, what what is pushing uh, so just IoT towards non-terrestrial and satellite solutions? Uh, so, just together with our my colleagues, we have tried to analyze so just these trends, and there are mostly three different groups of those. So the first one, uh, so just, which is especially strong in Europe, uh, so just is a social one. So just meaning uh, the need to achieve the equity of service and the quality of the life and uh, so just equal opportunities for everyone. Uh, so just as uh, all of us know, so just many of the services are now based on the IoT. Uh, so if you don't have access to IoT infrastructure, so just if you don't have IoT connectivity, so just you cannot enjoy the services. Uh, so just a second uh, track, so just is related to economic, uh, so just, uh, economic reasons, uh, so just bridging the gaps, uh, so just the coverage gaps, uh, so just in an efficient way, especially so just for the areas uh, so just which are remote, so just which you cannot 
easily addressed through the traditional terrestrial technology. And third one, so just this uh, environmental, so just a um, group of drivers, uh, so just which uh, are related to, for example, avoiding the terrestrial infrastructure in different fragile areas, as well as ensuring energy and spectrum efficiency. Uh, so, and here we are speaking about, for example, uh, getting rid so just of all the, uh, so just, uh, not only about getting rid of the base stations, the terrestrial base stations also are the least problem, so just, but also about the infrastructure around the terrestrial space stations. Uh, so just like cabling, like energy supplies, so just arounds for service and so on. So but let me be, uh, so just be clear at this point, so just uh, when speaking about the non-terrestrial, not communications, so just we are not proposing to replace the terrestrial and the sea. So but rather consider that to be complementary, so just to there, uh, so just to that for some specific specific use cases, uh, so just in specific scenarios. So some perspective applications, so just for uh, this type of uh, technologies, uh, so just again, three major categories. So the first one is the carbon exchange time each application, so just for uh, use cases where you don't have duplicate terrestrial connectivity. The second one are some sort of different ultramobile IoT applications, uh, so just which imply substantial level of mobility, so just like, for example, aerial systems, uh, so just then, the devices can easily get into so just in this area with no, uh, so just no coverage and dependable IoT applications, uh, so just which should uh, tolerate, for example, terrestrial connectivity malfunction, uh, so just or operate, so just with high reliability, uh, so just wherever they might end up. So, so example use cases, I think I want to go with use those. So there, so just the challenges uh, for non-terrestrial IoT, so just, I want, uh, so just especially for direct satellite examples, so just I will go, uh, I will briefly go through those. Uh, so just first let me uh, so just, uh, so just let me remark that uh, uh, so just I'm not aiming to provide absolutely accurate numbers here, so it's, it's also just, uh, so just very rough estimations so to, to provide you the order of magnitude, so just to illustrate the problem and the level of the challenge which has to be faced. So, when we are considering the um, uh, non-terrestrial IoT, so just what are uh, the problems? So just what are the main challenges? So here I will be speaking about these five, so just their attenuation, the latency, the scalability and the interferences, uh, visibility and handover procedures, and Doppler. So, starting with the first one, uh, so just apparently, when we are speaking about the satellite. So the minimum orbit, so just if we are speaking about a very low Earth orbit, is in the order of 100, 150 kilometers. So and it can go up easily, so just up to multiple thousands, uh, so just kilometers, so 36,000, uh, so just roughly if we are speaking about gas stationary satellites. Uh, so if we have the satellite not directly above the device, so just if it is, uh, so just on the edge of the visibility range, uh, so then the distance is much more, uh, so, just, so just here you can see the numbers, uh, so just, and uh, as you can imagine, so just if we are uh, speaking about these communication distances in the order of hundreds of kilometers, uh, so just the attenuation starts to play quite a major role. So here we have the numbers for uh, the attenuation for different carrier frequencies, so 100 so 100 uh, megahertz, 1 gigahertz, and 10 gigahertz. So just I haven't put here, so just the frequencies above that. Uh, so just, uh, I think for those, so just you can imagine, so just the numbers will be even more, uh, so, just, uh, uh, so just more high. So in any case, so just even if we are speaking about quite low frequencies, it's older hard that we are at, so just their uh, channel budget, so just which you have, uh, so just, uh, is in the or it exceeds so just 100 uh, so just dBs so just and closer to 120 dBs uh, so just and once we start uh, so just going towards uh, so just higher frequencies like one gig uh, so just we end up easily around 150 so just for example uh, here so just most of the lower orbit operate at uh, uh, orbit of around 600 kilometers so just we easily end up so just with uh, attenuation of around 150 uh, dBs. Uh, so just and with so just with higher frequencies with sub 10 gig, so just or you can expect since attenuation of 180 kilohertz. So 
another challenge, which is just related uh, so just to the propagation, is uh, so just the effect of the so just atmospheric propagation of the different frequencies, which, as you can probably know, as you probably know, uh, so just is not uh, so just uh, uniform and might change depending on the uh, so just on the frequency range which you are using. So, for example, this chart illustrates a specific attenuation, and you can clearly see so just the peaks. Uh, so just all attenuations of just all specific uh, gases, uh, so just uh, so just the atmosphere. Um, so some China and uh, actually another thing related to so just to the attenuation, uh, so just is the fact that uh, except the absolute value of attenuations like which you have there. So you also need to consider that uh, the attenuation fluctuates quite significantly as long as the sunlight moves. Uh, so changing, so just for example, within these ranges, so just, uh, ranges of values, so just you can easily see that. Uh, so just for example, uh, here, so just there, uh, depending on where uh, so just the satellite is, uh, so just the channel attenuation can change by 20 dB, uh, so just, just because of the changing of the distance between the uh, IoT terminal and the satellite. So to address this challenge, so just uh, of course, so just we have some approaches. So as some of you might know, so just uh, uh, on satellites, so just we can use quite bulk and quite effective directive antenna systems. Uh, so just also on satellites, so just we are not so much limited in the transmit power. So just that's one another thing so just which can be used, of course. Uh, so just satellite and thermal budget, so just introduce quite some limitations in the uh, so just, uh, in how much transmit power you can use, so but in theory, so you can use quite substantial transmit power. Uh, so there are also one very important aspect here, so this is optimization of the coding schemes to ensure this long-range communication, though it has some trade-offs, uh, so especially when we are speaking of scalability. So I will show you some of the uh, so just, um, some of the things. So just and, uh, <clears throat> another thing, so just on which um, we have started to work and uh, so which has quite uh, so there's still potential with respect to satellite communication since you can predict the mobility of the satellite. Uh, so just tracking and predicting the channel, so just one communication channel, and considering them uh, that when optimized, uh, so just the selection of the parameters you use. Uh, so another, so just another aspect of propagation, so just which is quite, uh, so it's quite important, especially when we start to speak about the channel access. So just is a latency. So as you can uh, so just easily imagine, uh, with their increase of the communication range, so just also increases their time which the radio signal requires to propagate from so just, uh, the point uh, so of the transmission, for example, the IoT terminal and up to the satellite. So just and here uh, so just are just some illustrative numbers for different orbits. So how it changes so just with the orbit, uh, so just for uh, so just minimum and maximum possible communication range. So what what can be seen is that uh, for so this was a minimum orbit, let's say, so just if you are speaking about very low Earth orbit satellites, uh, so just their um, propagation delay is in the order of half a millisecond, and so just when so just the satellite approaches uh, so just the visibility range, so just it increases to more than five milliseconds. So just with the increase of the orbit, of course, so just the minimum, um, so just minimum delay increases as well. Uh, so just um, and but so just a difference uh, between the minimum and the maximum delay, so just um, becomes comparatively lower. Uh, so just for example, for lower so, uh, so just for geostationary orbits, so just as you can see, so just we are uh, having quite uh, so just quite a big um, so just constant component. Uh, so just with so just just 20, 25 milliseconds so just delay variation. Uh, so of course that introduces quite some challenges. So just when we are trying to design so just the medium access protocols so just for uh, satellite communications, so and especially if we want to base it on uh, TDMA approach, since if you have a satellite, so just for example, imagine that we have a satellite that. Uh, Lower Earth orbit at about 600 kilometers. So, just some of the devices, so just uh, IoT devices under the satellite, so just will have the delay of 1.7 milliseconds, while the other ones located at the edge, so 
you just want there. Also, cell can have the delay for about 10 milliseconds, which is how can be coupled those. So that's why, so just one of the approaches, uh, so just to add this change, so this is based on the non TDMA based medium accesses, uh, so just like, for example, NOVA. Uh, so just over, uh, so just another approach which uh, is uh, considered and special in CGPP. So just is uh, tracking synchronization and precompensation for uh, so all these delays. Uh, so just benefiting from the fact that if you have, if you are communicating with a satellite, most likely you also have the access to GNSS information. So just including the time information, including the location of so the storage the terminal. But of course, the costs for that are, for example, additional energy consumption. Uh, so just other six. So scalability. Yes, so just another major challenge, especially when we're speaking about the Internet of Things devices. So just to give you also just an idea of so uh, how many devices uh, so just will have to be supported so just by the satellite systems. Uh, so just here are some numbers. Uh, considering so just very um, conservative approach that we have uniform distribution of devices, uh, so just have just one device per kilometer square, so just add satellite. Uh, so just you can see that even so just for a lower orbit satellite, uh, so just you will have to serve about six million devices. So within one, uh, so just by one uh, so just by satellite, or oh, within the communication range of the satellite, let me so just more accurate. And so just with increase, so just of the, uh, so just of the orbit height, so just you get even more uh, so just, uh, impressive numbers up to uh, so just 256 million so uh, so just for one device per kilometer square for geostationary satellite and uh, so just for 400 devices per kilometer square, which is uh, so just a met like, or the target which they have set in CGBP. Uh, so just we are speaking about uh, 102 billion uh, IoT devices. So not probably not very realistic at least with the current uh, set of the technologies. Anyway, so just the technologies. Quite a challenge. <clears throat> so luckily, uh, so just luckily we can uh, so just split uh, so just the cells. Uh, so just into smaller ones using directive antennas. We can form multiple beams. Uh, so just we can uh, increase the density of the satellites so just, uh, through smart constellation designs. So just uh, the multi connectivity between the satellites. And so just of course, uh, so just one of the most critical uh, so just issues here. So just other new medium access schemes. So next, the next thing so just uh, is related to the orbital velocity. I think as many of you know, uh, so just the lower is the orbit, the higher is uh, so just uh, the speed of the satellite. So and the lower is the visibility time, so just a time when a point so just on the ground will be visible by the satellite. And that's exactly so just what is shown here. Uh, so just that's the time in minutes when the satellite stays uh, so just within the visibility range, so just on the point, depending on the orbit. Uh, so just of course, for geostationary satellites, because we don't have this limitation, so just you can see the satellite 24 7, but once we start to decrease uh, so just the orbit height, uh, so just their um, so just exhibited time decreases quite substantially. And for lower orbit, again, so just the most easy, so just the most widely uh, used satellites nowadays, uh, so just we, let's say, at about 600 kilometers, so just we uh, usually get the exhibited time in the order of 12 to 30 minutes. So just Every 12 30 minutes, so just a new satellite will have to take, uh, so just like terminal, uh, so and uh, so to start serving that. Once we start reducing the so just orbit fuser, so just for example, for very low orbit, we are already speaking about something like six minutes. So during these six minutes, uh, so just their range between um, their uh, satellite changes. So just for example, here, as you can see, so just from 150 kilometers, let's say from. Uh, 1600 kilometers uh, to 150 kilometers and back. So, so this requires quite uh, so quite some optimizations. So just uh, regarding the constellations, so the design of the constellations, which is so just the topic of its own. Uh, so just as well of the so just handler procedures. Uh, so just for example, uh, one of the uh, just, uh, one of the things which might be meaningful for the Internet of Things specifically, uh, so just can be to optimize out the handle procedures completely, so that you won't need to so just to have any signaling, uh, so just to switch from one satellite to another. So just, 
So, okay, last but not least is uh, so just is a Doppler. So just apparently as the satellite moves, so just the distance changes, uh, you will see uh, so just a Doppler, uh, so just a change of the frequency. So here we are speaking about the two aspects of Doppler. So just the first one, uh, so just is a static Doppler, so just the absolute change of the frequency. And then, so just so the, another aspect is a dynamic Doppler, so just a rate of change of the Doppler, so just rate. Um, so just later I will illustrate so just some of the charts, uh, so just to show uh, so just how it works. Uh, so just so far I just note that down. So and the key point here, so just is a design of the elevator where physical and so just transceiver designs so just which can be coupled so just with this with this measure change. Okay, so just and now let me move on so just to the more technical things, uh, so just to to some uh, so just illustrations of how we tried to approach some of these problems in our previous uh, so just research works. Uh, so I will be speaking mostly about this uh, so six, so just six uh, aspects of the first three. Uh, so just focus on uh, so just the performance of their uh, direct to satellite based on LoRa technology. So by the way, is anyone familiar with LoRa technology? Is anyone familiar with it? No, not at all. Did anyone attend the course in Mars Networks? No, never seen it. There was this experimental networking course that also focused on IoT. I don't think it lets you play with Laura, but okay. yeah. Could maybe give a brief summary of what was the best case, like in your mm -hmm. words. Therefore. Okay. Okay, so then uh, so just I will try just since I have the slides, so just on the basics of the Laura technology. Three sentences. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, but yeah, so that's, uh, I think nowadays one of the most popular LBBA global wide network technology. Uh, so just originating from France, uh, so just operating in uh, so just uh, ISM frequency bands, so just using a lot of based so just, uh, channel access and uh, chipset spectrum, so just physical here. Uh, so just as I am, uh, I will speak a bit about the layer of HSS, so just uh, which is an extension of LoRa, especially for non terrestrial networks. Uh, so, and uh, two last points uh, so just would be about uh, so just, uh, unmanned aerial systems and vehicles, uh, so just, especially so just practical test of that. Okay, um, yeah, so just uh, I think I can briefly. Uh, so just it out as well. Uh, so just a lot of technology has appeared around 2015, and uh, so just it is as you can guess from the names. Uh, from the names of LoRa stands for Long Range Communication. So just it is intended for Long Range Communication. So just in 2020, I think the most uh, so they have done some experiments to understand what is the maximum communication range that is, which is possible with this technology. Uh, so just ended up with at least 800 kilometers. I think now uh, probably the record so just is even higher. Uh, to, um, speaking about the ground to, uh, to satellite communications. So, but anyway, so just at those times, um, uh, we started thinking so just well, uh, so the technology like that can be also employed for non terrestrial use cases. So, just operating with satellites, uh, so just as, as you can see, so just this 800 kilometers, it's actually lower than the distance to the air, so just lower the orbit. Uh, so the satellite, so just, which is stupid, between five, six hundred kilometers. Uh, so just started to look, so just if we can uh, so just employ this technology, so just for uh, satellite communication. So just, and, uh, so just so then we have done the analysis of the channel budget, uh, so just and other aspects, uh, so just related to so just propagation to understand which of the physical and position for the schemes, which is supported by LoRa one, uh, so just can be employed. So. Uh, some results so just are uh, uh, shown here. I think I, since uh, no one works on that, so just I won't go into so just too deep details. Uh, so what uh, the key outcomes uh, so just of this work was that yes, it is technically feasible. Uh, so you need to quite carefully select so just the spading factor, which is one of the main parameters for population. Uh, so just and as well as the bandwidth and one of the challenges which you will face for sure. So just with the scalability aspect of this technology. So departing from these very initial works, uh, so just we have also carried some uh, so some analysis for very specific scenarios uh, to understand for which applications can be employed. Uh, so just focus on specific on the three verticals, so just one is about the energy sector, 
Uh, so just uh, interestingly, our later so just we have found some information so just for so just some experimental data so just for uh, so just more satellites. So just and the trends which we observed experimentally by the people so just much as decently well so just this one we have seen so just from our simulator. So if you are interested, so just you can take a look. So just I really recommend so just this paper where uh, so just uh, real experimental simulations are just from a real more enabled so. Okay, so just uh, another thing, so just which we have done, uh, so just on which we are now doing, so just is related to the, uh, so just test bed instrumentation, so just specifically for this uh, LoRa, so just enabled satellites. So now we are deploying, or actually have deployed already, uh, so just uh, the so just receiver, so just with the satellite antenna, uh, so just on top of uh, so just our. Uh, laboratory building, so just which enables us to receive so the data from uh, several lower satellites which are now orbiting so just around the ground. So, uh, the next thing, so just which on which we have been working, so just what is the so called LRFHSS, so low rate uh, frequency hopping spread spectrum, so which is uh, one of the so just new physical layers introduced for LoRa. Uh, so specifically for non-terrestrial communication, so just and it's quite a major update. So just I won't go into very deep details, but it's a combination of a narrowband modulation, so just frequency hopping, uh, so just as well as so just uh, some redundancies through repetitions. Uh, so this has been introduced or announced in 2020. So gradually more information has been appearing. Uh, so just in the lower one specifications. Uh, so just we really have tried to understand so just what's going to be the capabilities of this technology, so this is for um, the to satellite communication scenario. Uh, so for now, majorly we have focused first of all on uh, so just the probability of packet delivery, so just in starting the scalability aspect of this technology. Uh, so just here are some results, I won't go, won't go very deep into those. Uh, so just in the second, uh, recently, so just uh, we have uh, also investigated uh, so just the practical performance of that uh, technology, especially when we are speaking about the energy budget, uh, so just what energy budget can we get, so how exactly it operates, so just what is time on air, so just to, uh, develop the analytical models to characterize that, so that we can estimate so just what's going to be the, uh, so just the performance, uh, so just the lifetime, so just to add, uh, the application feasibility. So Another thing, again, so just related to LoRa, <clears throat> so quite practical work, uh, so just is related to uh, so just LoRa 1, uh, of collecting so just all the data from uh, so just IoT terminals, uh, so just using LoRa 1 uh, flying gateway, so just we have instrument, in our uh, so just campus we do have, uh, so just a, quite a huge LoRa network, so just composing about 500 uh, sensors, actually, I think after finishing this presentation, I can briefly show you so just uh, this network, so just the data from it is available online. Uh, so just and we have investigated how so just we can connect uh, collect the data from this network, so the IoT transmissions from uh, so just using a so just uh, AL uh, platform, so just to draw so just instrument the gateway, so just and check the performance of that. Um, so just and also some uh, there are some. In addition to some uh, uh, analysis, initial analysis, uh, and information about how such a gateway can be designed, so just the resource and information and the data set, so just the collected data, so just if you're interested to take a look. So just, and by the way, if you are also working, so just with this IoT data, uh, so just the data sets from, uh, so just from this network, this campus level network, uh, so just it's also available online, so just I think we, for now we have the data for about four or five years. So just six or seven different parameters. Anyways, I'll show shows that later. Uh, so another thing, uh, so just quite recent experiments which we have done, so just uh, as a part of our uh, so just farm project, so just it's about using IoT, so just especially, uh, so just IoT sensors deployed by uh, UAVs or in that case on UAVs, uh, so just uh, for detecting the forest fires. Uh, so just here's, I think this trial was done about a one week ago. Um, so by, we have instrumented 
so just a sensor, so just on top, uh, so just actually in that case again, a lower base sensor, uh, so just on top of, uh, so just of the drone, and have seen, uh, so just how, have checked how different uh, sensors and measuring different parameters can be used for detecting the fire. Uh, so just, I think, for example, here, so just a chart showing uh, so just how the CO2 sensor can uh, enable so just the fire detection. So just for two flights, so just one with no fire. So the second one, so just here, so just here, so just peak, uh, so just when the fire was, uh, so just was lit. Yeah, so just also uh, so just, uh, some illustrations. And another track, uh, so just which we have uh, open, <coughs> this time not using lower technology, uh, so just is about uh, competitive awareness for drones. Uh, so just specifically uh, about adapting, so just uh, the competitive awareness messages, so just if you have what we call this V2X communication, uh, so just you likely know that protocol, uh, since it is the main, so just the main protocol used. Uh, so just for more competitive awareness for vehicles. Uh, so just we have suggested uh, the way to adapt this protocol also for drones. Uh, so just I am to uh, carry some tests so just to see how it can be implemented and how it can be used. Uh, so just for example, these miniature drones uh, uh, so just using Bluetooth low energy technology. Uh, so just we have seen so what can be the communication range, the scalability, and so on and so on. So just uh, results are currently so just in press. Okay, so there are a few other uh, so just ongoing uh, projects uh, for which I don't have currently the results since we have started. Uh, so just this project quite literally uh, recently. So one of them is related to so just 5G red cap and use capability, uh, suitability technology. Uh, so just in the context of direct satellite communications, which is the project has started uh, this summer. Uh, so we are currently working so just on the capabilities uh, so just of using this technology. So uh, satellite and another one, so just as well the multi-radio access enabled UAVs. So just uh, trying this concept in the context of several, uh, several different projects. So I have a question. Yes, please. Just on the previous slide, we mentioned uh, using drones on, uh, for, um, to measure wildlife, uh, wildfires, right? Oh, uh, yeah, exactly. I find this curious because, for example, in the US, they have banned the national parks because they themselves could be uh, fire hazards. Mm -hmm. I'm just, uh, well, were they deployed in, uh, in life? Or can you comment on that? Oh, so just, that's, uh, that's a good question. Yeah, so just, uh, so just in that case, um, yeah, as just you are right, those can be, so just can be an issue of the moon. But uh, here we are just considering uh, so just, uh, um, how they can be used. So just not only from communication perspective point of view, so just, but also in general. Uh, so just for uh, supporting the fire, uh, so just uh, wildfire detection, wildfire fighting, uh, because that's quite a big problem, so just uh, in Finland. Uh, so there, there's quite a big project, so just it was funded by the Academy of Finland that we have, a consortium, I think about six or seven partners. Uh, so just the most uh, so the most promising technology at this point uh, so just for wildfire detection for using the drones uh, so just first of all for detection are the autonomous drones uh, so just we are looking at how the operation of the drones can be done autonomous, uh, completely autonomous so you can imagine so some for example solar powered uh, recharging so just of the drones so that it can take off explore for example the areas which is where you expect that there might be a fire so then return so just uh, so just autonomously detect that so there is, for example, a danger of fire or the fire starting in other areas. Because currently, for example, in Finland, uh, so just all that is done more manually, so just they are uh, assigning a plane, so just to fly a specific route and uh, so just report if everything is fine or so just if, uh, so just the fire is starting. Uh, so just that's, let's say, one of the use cases. So and for that, of course, uh, so we need to use machine vision. So in terms of regulation, it was allowed in Finland to fly drones in the parks? Oh, so that's a very good question. Because regulations are so always technical. But you're now on record, so be careful <laughs> with the wording. Yes, yes. So just let me try to formulate it carefully. Uh, so the traffic comb, uh, so just the Finnish authority for uh, so just 
for both for traffic and communication. In, the, in a sense, we are lucky because that's, for us, it's one of the same organization. Uh, so just officially, uh, so just you cannot, I think, fly completely autonomous with drones. So what we are discussing with them, so just and, uh, uh, so so I think the results of this project, so just they are, uh, so we are collaborating with them, and they are looking at the results of this project, also to understand whether some of the regulations can be so just uh, idolized or not. Because actually another, uh, so just another challenge, major challenge which we face in Finland, uh, so just are the communication related um, so just restrictions, for example, uh, Finland is one of the very few countries uh, which explicitly prohibits uh, using of mo any mobile terminal on any flying object, so including drones. So technically, we cannot fly, uh, for example, 4G or 5G drones. So, but of course, uh, that's uh, well, you can do that given that you have got explicit uh, permission, uh, so just from let's say from the mobile network operator and so just a traffic control, just a uh, organization. So, but yes, we have done that, so just we have tried that, and we are hoping that uh, at some point of time this, all these regulations will be relaxed. So, by that time, so just we are, so just we are looking for, uh, so just for the opportunities so just to use uh, so just the system. Yeah, so just and the second, uh, so just the second thing. Uh, so just on which we are focusing in this project are uh, so exactly the situation, uh, let's say, when the fire has already started, so how can we support, for example, the fire brigade, uh, so just in exterminating the fire, so how can we, uh, for example, uh, detect the borders of the fire, uh, so just how can we predict the fire, uh, so just development, uh, so just detect the people close to the fire, and so on, so on, and so on. So the, uh, with respect to sensing for now, uh, so just the project is more focusing on machine vision, uh, since as you can imagine, so especially for autonomous flight, drones need cameras, and even for remote flight, so just you anyone need to have a camera. Uh, so just you always have that, but uh, we are also considering uh, so just about the use of IoT either, so just like here, so just for example, we have some IoT sensors installed on the drone, dropped by the uh, so just drone, so just or um, so just using the drones as communication infrastructure. So just like PlayStation, uh, so just as a server or a server, or so just even IoT PlayStation to connect the data. Okay, but I think uh, that's mostly, uh, so just mostly it. Uh, so just I think I need, uh, so just out of schedule. Um, yeah, so just I think the key points so just which I wanted, uh, so just wanted to, to, to mark here so just is about the non terrestrial satellite IoT, so just also quite interesting fields, it's quite uh, great potential, uh, so just which offer a lot of challenges at all sorts of uh, so layers of C stacks or physical link networks, whatever, so just you name it. Uh, so they can offer the ubiquitous coverage, uh, they can enable the uh, so just the services uh, so just which are currently impossible. Uh, so just, it can also serve as a backup option, so just with terrestrial infrastructure, for example, that gets out of order. So for example, we have quite close collaborations so just with uh, Japan on that. And that's exactly the scenario which they are most interested in. So just in case of emergency, so just what, uh, so just how can we recover the infrastructure, how can we provide the services. Um, so just and another so just my quite major issue so just which uh, we are just starting to look at uh, so just is about the integration between the terrestrial and non-terrestrial uh, so just services so that they can actually uh, quite effectively coexist and complement each other uh, so services yeah two two quick highlights uh, so just first if you're interested about uh, so just about the whole concept. Uh, so just currently we are preparing a book uh, so just focusing on integration of uh, MTC and satellite so just for IoT. Uh, so the plan is that it will be uh, so just published by Wine and IDW Press uh, so just in early 2024. So just quite uh, good uh, content. So just focusing on a uh, broad range of topics related to so just satellite IoT. So written by very well known experts. Uh, so, just in the second thing, so just uh, 
uh, as a part of the whole form of the Internet of Things. Uh, so you see the cover and both of us have to be having a workshop, so it's on the same topic. Uh, so in the case it will be around uh, so this is the internet for the internet of things, so you can't do more, so it's more than welcome to join. Okay, so just I think that's it from my side, so just perfect. Perfect time where it's on the phone. Are we ready to eat? Yes. Almost, yes. So please. Okay. okay. And therefore, yeah, I think everyone is tired for just of my presentation. So <laughs> no, no, no. Better. I think we should be here anytime where we start. Are you sure? Okay. So, thank you again, Constantine, for the great talk. We really appreciate it. Um, <laughs> Questions from the room, questions from the chat. I'll monitor the chat in the room, please. First come, first serve. On the USB ticket, we have a lot of ones. On the placement of the release of the mice, but when you know that the sensor is not in the sensor, or the placement is random and the sensor just connects whenever there's something available. So, just uh, let me go to that slide. So, just I think it provides uh, part of the answer to your question. So, just in the very center, so just you can see. Uh, so, these different cars are the different uh, trajectories of the drone. So, just we have tried uh, so several trajectories, uh, so there four or five of them in total. So, just a circular, so just the green flower, so just a green one. Uh, so just the blue ones so just here is just was the attempt of optimization. Uh, so just so using training uh, training so placement. Uh, so just problem and clustering. Um, so yeah, so and then we can uh, compare the performance of those. Uh, so just to see so just how how this affects uh, so just the performance. Uh, so just overall. But uh, overall, at least for this, uh, so just this part of the work, so just one as it all quite often happens so just it's a practical uh, so just, uh, practical work so just we figured out that one of the major issues which we have faced was uh, related to the antenna which we have used so it was not omnidirectional enough so overall so just as you can see so just here is an example of packet delivery rate so we have got about 30 something percent of all the packets which has been transmitted so from a protocol perspective the packet is just lost yeah, so just, uh, actually, there's a lot of technology, uh, so just from the protocol point of view, so just it's very simple, it's just a lock. So if you have lost it, then you have lost it. So in our case, it was not a big issue, so just anyway, the, uh, the data are transmitted uh, so just, uh, periodically, like I think every 15 minutes. So just in 15 minutes, you will probably get another packet, so just a small fraction for which so we can afford to lose those packets. But actually, uh, let me. Uh, as I have promised, try to show you. So just our campus network. Need to change. It's always a question in the chat as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've, I've seen that. Yeah, we'll take care of that once. Once the moment arrives for. So maybe that's a quick one. Oh, okay, no, please go ahead. Yes, yeah, so that's uh, just, uh, so that's a web interface of our so just uh, LoRa based uh, so just campus network. So just uh, this uh, number of sensors. So just I think we have in total three or four uh, different types of uh, so just sensors deployed all over the campus. Uh, so just which are uh, transmitting the data to a single gateway. So just in that case located so somewhere so just somewhere here. So just above our faculty. Uh, so just providing the data. So let me, for example, try to check uh, so some sensor close to my, uh, so just my room. So just let's see. So we can get information. Yeah, so just in that case, it's uh, so just environment sensors, so just getting light, uh, motion, I think also CO2 and um, Maybe something else. Yeah, temperature, humidity, as we understand, CO2 data. So just the data. So just here, by default, is shown for the previous week. 
uh, so I think it automatically um, so just adjusts uh, so for the time zone. Uh, so as you can see here, it shows that uh, uh, so we have the light. Uh, so, this, so the light ends so it's around 12 uh, so just, uh, uh, at noon. So keeping in mind seven hour uh, difference, time difference. So that more or less matches so just the so just the duration of so, uh, daylight time. So this is actually having to. So then, so just we have this motion sensors. So just it serves the today, so it just serves the Wednesday, Tuesday, Monday. So but there also some movements or during the weekends. So some students around. And so on. So just and yeah, so just as I have told, so just we have about 400 different sensors. I think some of those are um, so just especially the ones equipped with uh, so just with a microphone, so just are now out of the battery, so just in shown red here. Uh, so just for the other ones, so, so just the data from the other ones is available. So just if you're interested to do some analysis, and by the way, they also include the information about the relevant communication parameters like SSR and whatever. Um, so we are so just very eager to provide those so just information so you can access the data just for the next four or five years. Yes. Before we continue further, there was a question in the chat, and maybe we could slowly start or go, go, go into the pizza time meanwhile. So the question was basically how deep in Earth can you go for the underground satellite communications? You mentioned that not very deep, but maybe some numbers. We we're talking like five centimeters, one meter, oh. twenty-two meters. What did you try? What are the main factors affecting so, the choice? So just on the slides, so because there was a reference, uh, so I think the paper is now out. Uh, so just it, was, uh, so just was, it should be like people they explore, uh, and I think it was published in May. Uh, so just it's more information, so just actual uh, the accurate numbers. Uh, so if I recall it right, uh, <coughs> uh, so just we are speaking about 30, 20, 30 centimeters. So there 20, 30 was, centimeters of the ground. Okay. Okay. So, so you could do some road signs or maybe some road surface condition sensors, but we're talking about the metro sensor, the metro no, sensor no. cannot talk to a satellite. Okay. So let me put it so we just uh, if uh, the sensor is let's say 20, 30 centimeters under the ground, so just it will work with decent high probability. If it is between 30 and let's say 60 centimeters. Um, so just it depends. So just if it is below say 60, 70 centimeters, then probably not. Thank you very much. So if any of our online guests are still uh, willing to, to join the Q&A and ask any questions, maybe that's that's a very good moment to do that, and then we could just keep chatting in the room and asking any further here. Let's just switch on the mic and go ahead. Okay, seems no more from the chat, so. For the questions from the room that you want to ask in the formal environment, or I'd say let's start very dishes and eating something. So thank you very much, Master. Sorry, yeah. Yeah. Oh, go ahead. Okay. <laughs> now everyone's going to hit you, but please. <laughs> sure. So I just wondering how a small device can communicate to a satellite so far away. There is more frequencies or no frequencies or. Uh, yeah, so just most most of the time, uh, so just the frequencies are below one gig. Uh, so just we, so just we uh, have tried it. So just let's say for 800 megahertz band, so just so just 900 megahertz band in the US. Uh, so just also for 400 megahertz band. Uh, so just for those, it uh, so just it works for. Uh, so just there are also frequency bands allocated for satellite communications around two. So just for example, 2.1. Uh, so just uh, gigahertz, uh, so just at 1.8, 1.9 gigahertz bands. Uh, so just it will also probably work. So, but uh, you know, so just one of the, so just one of the parts of the answer is, uh, it depends on how good antenna you have in the satellite. Because uh, if you, for example, consider, uh, so just the, uh, so just the existing, let's say, in my satellites, um, so Advanced communication system satellites, uh, so there you might easily get so just an antenna with a gain of 30 or 40 degrees dBm. So that enables you to fight all the uh, over two 
somehow reduce the effect of the accumulation in the future of something. Mm. And <clears throat> if, for example, if you have like many uh, devices, how do they, they all communicate uh, directly to the satellite, or do they just use a, a base cell, uh, and then base cell to just... Actually, that was uh, part of the, uh, of the first papers, uh, which we have written, so when we were investigating the whole concept, so there were, uh, so just a single thing that we have done, we, uh, proposed two different architecture. One is, uh, so is direct to satellite, and another one is exactly what you say through the gateway. Uh, so, just and, so as you can imagine, there are pros and cons in either of these approaches. So, if you have some cluster deployment, so just if you have a gateway, probably it is easier and better so just to use a gateway. So, but then you introduce a point of failure, so a bottleneck, so just if something happens with the gateway, you are done. So, the whole application is done. Uh, so just at the same time, it's direct to satellite, so just, of course, if, if something is wrong with the satellite, so just, you are, uh, so just again screwed. So, but otherwise, on that, so just at least you can get some data. Uh, so, but the longer communication distances, uh, so just higher chances of interferences, and so on. So just, uh, it depends on the application, like, like I would say, it's always with IoT. Thanks. Any more questions before the launch time? Thanks. So thank you again. Okay. So thank you. Thank you.